I'm just going to allow a few people to come into the room um, and then I'll, I'll start tonight's online lecture. Okay, I'm going to begin. Uh, welcome to this online lecture from National Strategy to Strategy in Policy, hosted as a joint initiative between the School of Security Studies, Department of War Studies, and the Corbett 100 Project. The Corbett 100 Project marks the centenary of the death of historian, strategist, and philosopher of sea power maritime strategy, Sir Julian Stafford Corbett. I'm your host, Dr. James W. E. Smith, Research Fellow in the War Studies Department at King's College London, and I'm joined by two speakers today. First is Professor Beatrice Hauser, Chair of International Relations at the University of Glasgow and currently seconded to the German Staff College in Hamburg, Germany. Professor Hauser is a trained historian, political scientist, and distinguished author of publications on the evolution of strategy and strategic thought has been central to many war studies curricula for civilian students and both impactful and influential in the private military education and beyond the United Kingdom. Her publications include The Evolution of Strategy, Thinking War from Antiquity to the Present in 2010, Strategy Before Clausewitz, Linking Warfare in Statecraft, 1400 to 1830 in 2017, and her latest publication released earlier this year in 2022, War and Genealogy of Western Ideas and Practices. Our second speaker is Professor Andrew Lambert, Lawton Chair for Naval History and Fellow of King's College London. An active member of teaching and research staff at King's, Professor Lambert's career has led him to become the eminent naval historian of our times. His work focuses on the naval and strategic history of the British Empire between the Napoleonic Wars through to the First World War and the early development of naval historical writing. His recent publications include The British Way of War, Julian Corbett and the Battle for a National Strategy, 2021, and Sea Power States, which won the 2018 Gilda Lehrman Book Prize in Military History. Before handing over to our speakers, I wanted to provide a very brief abstract or context to today's webinar. The serious study of strategy, strategy making, and how it can inform policy making has been no easy task, nor one that lends itself to a hasty process, whether it's in the 21st century or the classical period. The study of strategy has taken on many forms and guises over the centuries, such as the art of war through to the analysis of national ways of war and the many facets of strategy, national power and influence and so on that I could mention. But in short, there's been effort led by historians directed to study and clearly understand the impact, role and influence of war within society and between nations or otherwise. Over recent centuries, there have been sustained and objective engagement we have a sophisticated and contemporary professional methodologies to achieve insight from studying the past in an effort to provide a basis for current and future strategy. Many serious strategists understood that experience in applied history must guide strategic theory, as after all, experience is all we have to work with. Certainly a key thread from Professor Hauser's and Lambert's scholarship is that war is an art, not a science. However, this process is not a quick one, one often at odds with policy making in defense, foreign affairs, or national security in many nations. A process seemingly at odds, or in the 21st century in conflict with lawmakers, the drivers of policy, and some within militaries. Increasingly, it is the wishful thinking of the military mind to try and fit the serious study of strategy to fit into neat little doctrinal pam pamphlets, and elsewhere those who may encourage that strategic way of thinking guide decision making runs headlong into the public servant who controls national finances. And all of this influenced by the short-term cycles of contemporary political systems, which can equally change direction as the fashions of the moment or the political and international winds blow. There are few, although you are about to hear about some individuals who did achieve to translate strategy and strategically minded national defense planning into something useful and recognizable to policymakers. Although today perhaps more hampered by techno babble military service ideology and technologists. But the evolution of technology and the art of war is hardly something new, whether that be the invention of the longbow Agincourt, 
the advancements of naval strike, the invention of military aviation, nuclear weapons, and now a digital electronic information age with unparalleled surveillance and lethality from seabed to space. Such has been the pace of change, we have seen debate over arguably war and maintaining the peace that's banned, and perhaps thinking strategically cast aside, replaced by reactionary responses and ways of thought. Yet we find ourselves called back to the basic tenets and importance to think more seriously, prolonged and deeply on the basis of experience to develop coherent thought, doctrine and strategy at a national or operational level. A serious student of military history and war studies understands that the study of strategy is a never ending process of learning and thinking where you can look to the efforts of previous scholars and historians to guide you. The speakers you'll hear from today and the topics and individuals they will discuss are part of that process, have studied and wrote and contributed while also bringing on the next students to advance the work and continue the process of understanding fundamental questions related to strategy alongside past and future choices. On that note, I'll hand over to Beatrice. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, with my presentation. Bear with me one second while that works. And I hope that you will be able to see it now. Okay, now the big question is, will it move? I have chosen to concentrate on three very important ideas or uh, clusters of ideas, if you like, that um, at, the, on, at the same time, uh, Corbett uh, took from Clausewitz to some extent uh, and at some time uh, and modified himself. In one case, he clearly departed from Clausewitz, and in other cases, he modified Clausewitz and brought him up to date to fit to see how both Karl Clausewitz's and Corbett's thinking fit into a greater evolution of strategic thinking. And you will see that these ideas go from something very concrete and limited, namely the, the role of battle in the context of strategy, to the larger question of whether war can be limited, is, or it will be absolute at all times, or whether there what limitations there are to war, and then to the potentially even bigger question of how strategy is made and what the role is there of politics and what the role is there of the military in the making of strategy. So let me begin by the first very simple topic, the one about um, the role of battle. Now, this is where um, you will see the Corbett parted company with Clausewitz, although he very clearly um, discussed for himself the thoughts of Clausewitz and took issue with them. Um, you must see that Corbett's own background is one of having been thinking about the role of naval battle in particular in this very large body of military history that he wrote, naval history that he wrote, ranging from the late 16th century all the way to his own times, looking at the many different ways in which, which navies were used uh, throughout these centuries, with battles actually being just one of several means of waging war at sea. He, this is a contrast, of course, to the way in which Clausewitz saw battle. And let me just remind you that he wrote that the annihilation of the inimical armed forces is the main principle of war and the main way to reach the aim of the war. And this annihilation of the armed forces mainly takes place only in engagements, battles. Only large scale and general engagements lead to great successes. Successes are the greatest if the engagements come together in one great battle. Only in the main battle does the military commander in chief hold all the strings in his own hands. And the main purpose of great battles has to be the annihilation of the inimical armed forces. The main battle is the most natural means of achieving a big positive purpose. Now, this approach to battle was something that was extremely congenial to the very military minded writers and thinkers, particularly on the continent, but not only on the continent of Europe in the later part of the 19th century, where you have many, many agreeing on the centrality of battle, not only because they were um, inspired by Clausewitz, but because they were inspired by the entire uh, culture around them that became increasingly militaristic as the 19th century um, moved on. And those included people like Willem from Willison, 
um, but also in Britain, Colonel Morris, um, then Prince Kraft of Hohenlohe, Colmer von der Goltz in the German speaking lands, GFR Henderson again in the UK, and we find it even reflected in the United States Kingdom's army manual. So this centrality of battle was something that was really amazingly universally recognized. I have forgotten to cite some French authors here, but you could cite French authors as well. This was something that was pretty generally held on most of continental Europe. And this is a bit where, uh, very ad quite admirably, um, Corbett stepped aside from this tradition, went against this tradition, and uh, wrote that this was a fallacy. It was a fallacy to think that war consists entirely of battles between armies or fleets. It ignores the fundamental fact that battles are only the means to enab of enabling you to do what, which, that which is really brings a war to an end, that is to exert pressure on the citizens and their collective life. So very importantly, it was uh, Corbett who managed to break with this uh, um, tradition which was um, all around him. And of course, that meant that he made himself a lot of enemies and a lot of adversaries. Um, Corbett um, wrote elsewhere, the current conception of the functions of a fleet is dangerously narrowed and our best minds cramp their strategical views by assuming unconsciously that the sole function of a fleet is to win battles at sea. But this is the supreme function of the fleet is certain but on the other hand convenient opportunities of winning a battle do not always occur when they are wanted the first preoccupation of the fleet will almost always be to bring them about by interference with the enemy's military and diplomatic arrangements and it is not accidental that we find this in a book that he wrote about england in the seven years war where he simply took a larger um view of history and looked at past periods and not only at this battle obsessed 19th century from which he had only just emerged and his countrymen so um it was it's very important that therefore he um assumed and he, he postulated from this that naval battle was not always central naval battle seeking out the enemy's fleet is not always helpful he thought either you will find that it in a place where you cannot destroy it except at a very heavy cost which you then probably should choose not to incur instead he articulated in the green pamphlet in his original version of 1906 that the primary object of the fleet is to secure communications and if the enemy's fleet is in a position to render them unsafe it must be put out of action the enemy's fleet usually is in this position but not always and seeking out the enemy's fleet is only one way of doing this and not always the best Perhaps it's even nine times out of 10 the best, but still, he was very concerned that one shouldn't make this a one size fits all rule that applied always. Here we can see that uh, this big departure that Corbett uh, um, in, uh, incorporated would be a step towards something which almost 100 years later, or at the end of the 20th century, would be articulated in a complete revision of this Clausewitzian approach and of the approach that had led to the Second World War and the way which was afforded, for which I'll just give you one little example to show the development of this in the writings of John Warden, now an air power specialist, not a naval specialist, but nevertheless, I thought that this passage was particularly significant and ex particularly exemplary of the change of thinking, particularly after the end of the Cold War, where John Warden, as this air power specialist, wrote, the purpose of war is not to defeat the enemy's armed forces. I mean, this is now more extreme still than, than Corbett, a lot more extreme. Paradoxically, it may not even be to win the war itself. The only reasonable purpose of war ought to be to win the peace which follows and all planning and operations should be directly connected with the final objective then he added that everybody was paying lip service to this idea but in policy military and academic circles we easily get lost in the Clausewitzian world in fact people he thought were still dominated by this Clausewitzian idea in which the defeat of the enemy military forces becomes an end in itself rather than merely one of a number of possible means to a higher end. Let me just explain that by the end of the 20th century, uh, we had well and truly returned to a way of thinking that prevailed in Europe before Clausewitz wrote where it was clear to everybody that the most important thing about war was the peace that follows and that this peace that follows should be just and lasting, which is, I suppose, what John Warden talks about when he said to win the peace that follows. And that it took a very long time after the writing of Clausewitz for people to return to this particular approach, 
when they had for a long time been obsessed with the idea of military victory, something that came in with Napoleon and with Clausewitz and Jomini writing about Napoleon, because both Clausewitz and Jomini failed to write about um, really the, the subjugation or the, the uh, lower importance of military victory compared with the, the superior aim of getting a lasting peace which everybody before Clausewitz had always recognized. So in a strange way, with this John Warden quote, you come full circle to a situation, a position that people had before Clausewitz wrote, and Corbett's was a very important step in this direction, with Corbett himself opening himself up to an awful lot of criticism, of course, precisely for taking this position, for taking this step in a way forward and backwards to another way of thinking, which put peace, a lasting and just peace, at the pinnacle of war aims rather than the military victory. So that was the first point I wanted to uh, discuss with you briefly. Um, let me go on to the second one, which is these distinctions between absolute war, limited war, and something that inspired Corbett, which was a very small throwaway phrase of Clausewitz's, where he said there might sort of be a third uh, sort, which was war limited by contingent. Clausewitz, on the whole, really just concentrated on these two ideas of absolute war on the one hand, war um, meaning war unlimited by, i.e. absolved from, any political constraints or friction as well, but particularly political constraints, which was the case for the Napoleonic Wars, which kept going further and further where Napoleon did not try to limit himself in his ambitions. The characteristics of these wars would be then to have mass armies involved with the population very largely mobilized as largely as you could do in a pre industrial age. And with the aim of overthrowing other governments uh, regime changes, we would now call it or at least turning them into vassals to France. And to turn large parts of Europe into a one aparte dynastic possession. So these were the pretty unlimited aims under Napoleon in particular, but we would sum them up by mass armies, aim of throw, overthrowing other governments, subjecting very large numbers of other countries to the rule of the one big expansionist power with those unlimited uh, aims. And that all that in the context of, of course, very large battles, annihilation battles. Clausewitz contrasted this with the possibility of limited wars, wars that were limited by political constraints, where the respect for the adversary or wars between equals that respected each other equally uh, meant that you didn't want to overthrow the other regime, that you didn't have this completely unlimited aim, but only quarreled really about a province or a limited territory that in some way you wanted to seize or might even just take in order to be able to negotiate at peace conferences and to exchange such conquests for other benefits in peace negotiations if necessary. Now, Clausewitz was still assuming that you could make such territorial gains in war and, and trade them in peace negotiations. There's a passage here that I share with you from Clausewitz's On War, where he says war was only a stronger form of diplomacy under the Ancien Regime before Napoleon came, a more vigorous way of negotiating, which battles and sieges were the main démarche. Even the most ambitious only aimed to acquire a limited advantage they could use in peace negotiations. So here, this idea that at the time of the Ancien Regime, before the rise of Napoleon and with him, the rise of nationalism, such limited wars were possible and such limited territorial exchanges such limited territorial conquests and then trading them again was possible. But in fact, this was quite transformed even in the in Clausewitz's lifetime by the arrival of Napoleon, because henceforth this revolutionary drive of Napoleon was fused with nationalism, meaning that, in fact, even a conquest of a small piece of territory could put up the backs of a nationalist entity, a nationalist people, and make them extremely angry and make them quite, quite determined that they would go to war over and over again to secure these territories. And this, in a way, came to a pinnacle in Bismarck's wars. Um, what in this very blurred photograph, which didn't look anywhere near as blurred when I put it on my PowerPoint slide, I apologize for this, shows you the statue of the city of Strasbourg in Paris on the Concorde. Um, and Strasbourg is, of course, in Alsace. When 
in the Bismarckian Wars, France was forced in the Treaty of Frankfurt not only to pay horrendous reparations to the victorious Prussian and then German Empire, but also forced to cede that small amount of territory that would have been quite exemplary of what Clausewitz said. This became quite unacceptable for a nation now fully conscious of the sort of nationalist fervor shared throughout Europe at that stage. And this statue um, in the middle of Paris was veiled, was shrouded in black uh, tissue um, for people to see at all times so that you could always, as the saying was, always think about it, even if you didn't talk about it. So the idea that you wanted to reconquer, free this territory, this small piece of territory that had been seized by the German Empire uh, was something that was a driving force, an actual diplomatic aim, and even became a war aim in the First World War. Incidentally, it is not without interest that you can see something similar in Moscow. In Moscow, of course, like London and Paris, you have several railway stations all pointing in the directions of the different uh, areas of the old Soviet em Russian Empire, Soviet Empire, um, with which these railways then could link up Moscow. And there, if you look at the, there is the Ukrainian railway station. And in a similar way, this Ukrainian railway station has, of course, even since the end of the 1990s, been there as a constant reminder of the loss of Ukraine. And I'm sure it's also been one contributing factor to this perception of Russians in Moscow, the Muscovites, that Ukraine really should be part of Russia and that it is somehow wrong to have lobbed off this part, this essential part of the Russian anatomy. To describe this new feeling that came in in the 19th century, this idea of nationalism, um, just a little ex excerpt from somebody who still coexisted and lived at the same time as Corbett, uh, the, the Prussian author Kolmar von der Goltz, who wrote that the growth of national motives of jealousy and national enmity entails a corresponding display of force where such forces set the great machinery of war into motion, wars can only end with the entire annihilation of one party or the complete exhaustion of both. The growing national sentiment and the political realization of the principles of nationality have increased to a marvelous extent the powers of resistance of states. So here, just the formulation, the explanation of how you could no longer think of it in terms of a limited war for the thinkers of that time. And he added, the day of the cabinet wars is over, the cabinet wars as described by Clausewitz, the wars uh, in which you could simply seize a small piece of territory and then uh, bargain over it. Wars have become solely the concern of the nations engaged. A clashing of interests leads to war, but the passions of the nations decide independently of these up to what point the war shall be carried. War now is before aids polity in the attainment of its objects, yet if only for the sake of subordinate interests, it must aim at the complete subjection of the enemy. This necessarily entails this decisive use of all means intellectual and material like tending to subdue the foe. So here again, this idea that a limited war for him and for his contemporaries was no longer possible. And indeed, Colma van der Goltz and others in his time decided that they had to part company with Clausewitz, not like Corbett, because they didn't like this emphasis on battle, but unlike Corbett, because they felt that Clausewitz hadn't gone far enough in saying that only the big battle was possible and no small and limited wars were possible and the be all and end all of war would be the annihilation, well indeed the complete subjection of the enemy and the, uh, the humiliation of the enemy, of, of which he was of course totally right. Corbett did indeed recognize that one had moved away from the possibility of having a limited war in Europe. So talking about Europe, he said, if then we only regard war between contiguous continental i.e. European states in which the object is the conquest of territory on either of their frontiers, we get no real generic difference between limited and unlimited war because these wars would escalate, the European powers would escalate them, they would go further, they would no longer be able to see these as limited wars. But, he thought, we, if we extend our views to wars between worldwide empires, the distinction at once becomes organic. Possessions which lie oversea or at the extremities of vast areas of imperfectly settled territory 
on an entirely different category from those limited objects which Clausewitz contemplated. History shows that they can never have the political importance of objects which are organically part of the European system, and it shows further that they can be isolated by naval action sufficiently to set up the conditions for true limited war. So for Corbett, limited war did indeed continue to exist. It might not be compatible but what, with what was going on in Europe, but he realized that this could happen in far-flung colonial possessions. And that's what he concentrated his particular thinking on. Um, so if you, the idea of true limited objects, therefore we must leave the continental theaters and turn to mixed or maritime wars, which was then an area that he explored. So very interesting, much larger view of the world than you find in the critics of Clausewitz, uh, like Koma von der Goltz and many others of that period. Let me turn to my third point. Um, so I'll, I'll just do to end there that uh, therefore Corbett developed these uh, different discussion of absolute war of limited war and um, very importantly this he developed further this idea of war limited by contingent the British way of war, which he thought was possible, mainly in a naval context only. So my third point, um, which is the big question of what predominates politics, the politic or the military or what in for this particular point i need to take you back a long time before clausewitz because i think it is unfair to keep saying that this was a clausewitzian discovery it really went back a hundred years before clausewitz and he cribbed it from other people even though he slightly changed the emphasis in it um, Basically, somebody called Guibert, he, who lived in the mid um, 17th, 18th century, uh, in a book that he wrote just after the Seven Years' War, but that was only published in the mid 18th century, had already talked about the fact that there was la politique, which consisted of two branches, domestic politics and foreign policy, and that foreign policy had to control, had to dominate the use of the armed forces and also diplomacy, and that those two really had to interact, and that it was very important that domestic politics and foreign policy should work together very closely, that they should mutually strengthen each other. Then there was somebody who I think was somebody called Santier, but he published anonymously in 1774, a very interesting book, again, about the conduct of war, in which he said, decreed that there had to be the cabinet, very much in the British sense of cabinet, only you have to imagine that it would have been under a king or other monarch who was still actively involved and not just a figurehead. So the cabinet would have to decide on an overall war plan that had to be distinguished between a political war plan drawn up jointly by the ministers and generals jointly. Very important, this idea that they should cooperate because the ministers, ministers the, the, the civilian ministers, would hardly understand how to use the politically military tool properly and had to do this jointly with the military. And then from that, the military could derive a campaign plan. So here was already an, an, another idea that a political larger grand strategy, if you like, had to dominate and direct a military complaint plan, if you like, it would be strategy directing operations. Um, Immanuel Kant had already said that war was the state's application of its power in pursuit of its rights, which is another way of saying that war is a continuation, is a tool of state policy. And um, Clausewitz's contemporary, in the same promotion as a young officer, uh, Otto August Rühle von Lilienstern wrote on the relationship between war and the state that the state must dominate the raw violence of war in such a way that war allows itself to become a useful instrument of an enlightened statecraft. So war as instrument of statecraft, so cl clearly both Kant and Rühle von Lilienstern had already said that the state uses war as an instrument. Uh, Rule took this a little bit further, in which he said that it was very important that dipl diplomacy, or he said, politics, as it is also called, goes hand in hand with the art of war. And this could be done either when you have the prince himself being both the military leader and also the chief diplomat or the chief negotiator, or where you have a supreme command that is left to a supreme military commander, or where the, where the foreign minister works closely with the military and knows his job well enough, and even the military job well enough to be able to coordinate this. Another contemporary of theirs, who was the most read, most widely read 
Prussian author of his times, before coming to a very nasty, sticky end at the hands of the Russians a few years later, wrote that strategy must be subject to diplomacy, the knowledge of the state's interest. Here again, really, the idea that strategy has to be below uh, la politique, as Guibert would have said it. For the atrocities of war are never given as the purpose of war, as war is not something complete within itself, but merely a means for the achievement of the diplomatic aim. So here again, this idea that diplomacy should prevail over strategy, which in turn should dominate tactics, as he said in another passage. You need this as a background to see just to what extent Clausewitz was on the one hand copying all the others when he wrote famously that war is not an independent thing, but the continuation of politics with altered means. Consequently, the main outlines of every major strategic plan are primarily political in nature and that he wasn't either very original when he said until now one has sought to divide the military element of a great strategic plan from the political trying to regard the latter as something irrelevant well it wasn't even true that people had seen these two things as distinct as i showed you with all those quotations that i just subjected you to and famously of course was nothing but a continuation of politic political endeavor with altered means or the famous passage that i won't read to you because you know it the political act was a mere continuation of depolitik with other means, etc., etc. It's a political instrument. So those famous passages from Clausewitz are um, really based on what a lot of people had been saying around that time as well. The what is perhaps interesting there is that each one of them had a slightly different emphasis on diplomacy or uh, politics or something like that, where sometimes you see the political decision making as an equal of the military, and in most cases people saw it as the military as clearly subordinated to some political decision making. Let's jump forward to uh, Corbett. Um, who, of course, took this idea from Clausewitz, slightly rephrased it, warm as a form of political intercourse, a continuation of foreign politics, which begins when force is introduced to attain its, our ends, where for Corbett, there's clearly most emphasis on this idea of a transition of foreign policy turning into warfare at that particular time that war begins. Um, Let's turn to how he used Clausewitz's mission of strategy. Strategy is the use of engagements for the object and purpose of war. So again, the, the object and purpose of war is the superior notion and strategy um, is the thing that is subordinate to it, um, from which Corbett took the idea that there was something, what she called a major strategy. As we'll see in a second, he occasionally also called this grand strategy in which you were dealing with ulterior objects, and that is reflected in the plan of the war. And then you had minor strategy, the word operational art had not yet been invented. So he already made this distinction between the two, seeing the need of an extra word, an additional word. And here is uh, an actual piece of text with which he defines all this major strategy in its broadest sense, has also to deal with the whole resources of the nation for war. It is a branch of statesmanship, Army and Navy are instruments of war, but for major strategy, uh, but major strategy also has to keep in view constantly the politico diplomatic position of the country on which depends the effective action of the instrument and its commercial and financial position by which the energy for working the instrument is maintained. And finally, uh, the friction between these two considerations is inherent in war, and we call it the deflection of strategy by politics. It is usually regarded as a disease. That's very much the case for a lot of the Prussian thinkers in his time, but also the French thinkers who wanted to have as unfettered a way of war as they could possibly have, unfettered by politics, that is. But Corbett recognized that it is really a vital factor in every strategical problem. No question of grand strategy. This is where he uses grand strategy as synonymous with major strategy can be decided apart from diplomacy. So clearly he links the two very strongly. But I would put it to you that he was not quite, quite sure um, how to define this hierarchy. The text is sort of slightly ambiguous, so you could say that it's either major strategy that is at the top, um, with a politico-diplomatic position and commercial financial position, etc., the countries uh, sub subjected to it, um, or else 
uh, it's not quite clear whether he sees major strategy as something that is on par with the political diplomatic position and influenced on par by commercial and financial positions of the country. So that's still this slightly ambiguous text um, in the context, of course, of several decades of strife, particularly in Prussia, but also elsewhere, between the military and the political leadership under various monarchs and emperors and presidents, uh, where the question was always that once war begins, whether diplomats and political leaders should take second place and wait for the war to be ended by the generals, a, a big debate that was uh, reflected in the contest between Bismarck and Moltke, but also in other countries, or whether in fact the political leadership should play a role also in the conduct of war itself. As you can imagine, it's quite easy to see who would have been on the side of saying, well, the military should take over completely, and who should have been on the side of saying, no, 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 politics must always guide the way of war. Um, just to put it into context, I think this com evolution was complete, really, with Little Heart, um, who, as far as I can tell, was not really influenced by Corbett, but simply took these ideas one step further when he said, well, strategy is the art of distributing, applying military means to fulfill the end of policy, and strat grand strategy is what coordinates the, all the resources of a nation, not just the military, but all the other resources towards the attainment of the political object of the war, the goals defined by fundamental policy. So now it's really, with little heart, it's really clear how the overall um, hierarchy is, which is simply that fundamental policy has to be at the top, dictating grand strategy, which in turn dictates how armed forces, diplomacy, economy and society is used, just to contextualize this whole development there. Um, so after Paul Corbett, there, this consensus of um, came into being that really uh, there should be this primacy of the political lead. But the challenge, of course, of bringing the knowledge and the language gap between political leaderships and mil the military continues. And it is now that which is the main uh, field of debate in the question of how politics and the conduct of war should be framed, how that should be processed and how that process should be carried out. Thank you very much for your attention. I will stop sharing at this point and hand over to Andrew. Excellent. Thank you very much. That was um, a masterly demonstration of why we need to read our strategic thinkers in context and not to pick them out and, and hold them up alone as individual voices. This is an, an endless process. And what we've been given access to is a way of thinking about how strategists are impacted by their context, what they bring to the process of making strategy, and how this is a cumulative exercise rather than, uh, as some would like to have it, a matter of inspired and new work. Where I want to start, I think, is with Corbett's work and this question about how these ideas get into the political structure and the adversarial nature of the, the civil military debate in which soldiers like Kalmar von der Goltz are talking about a war which essentially has nothing to do with civilians and Corbett is talking about a war which is absolutely under the control of civilians. And of course, Corbett, unlike all of the, the other strategists, that Beatrice mentioned is a civilian. He has not served in the army, the Navy, but he has served in other branches of activity which shape his thinking and also enhance his ability to join this debate. So he's one of the first Cambridge University students to take a law degree rather than taking a classics degree and then transitioning. So he has a first class law degree from Trinity Cambridge he then qualifies as a barrister and he practices as a barrister. So he's a courtroom advocate in, in American parlance. And his job is to put together arguments on behalf of his clients. He is not talking about right or wrong. He's talking about the quality of the argument. And the job of a barrister is to represent their client to the best of their abilities. And what he's representing is the role of the civilian political leadership because alongside his 
career in the law, he is also a fully paid up member of the Liberal Party, which in those days was a governing party of enormous influence in British life. He serves in local government and on at least two occasions, possibly three, he is offered a fairly safe Liberal seat in the House of Commons, where he would have joined his elder brother who is already serving as an MP. So he's right at the heart of the political elite, not at the heart of the naval or military elite. His audience primarily, I think, is the people who are going to make those decisions, those political level decisions. It's not accidental that that great book, England in the Seven Years' War of 1907, which Beatrice um, highlighted in the talk, one of the first people he sent a copy to was the Secretary of State for War, Richard Burden Haldane, a fellow lawyer, who would end up as Lord Chancellor. And the book is used to put an argument about the nature of British strategy in as a maritime, expeditionary, amphibious strategy. And the purpose of sending it to Haldane is to make sure that Haldane, as the responsible minister, shapes the army to serve that end rather than following the wishes of many of his uniformed advisors which would have been towards a more normative continental approach uh, to the army. And Haldane's response, which is very quick, is that he's read the book and he has his staff working on it to develop what will become the British Expeditionary Force. That's where Corbett is absolutely critical. His day job, as far as he has to work, he's unbelievably rich, so he doesn't have to do any work at all, but he does, is teaching mid and senior level naval officers how to interact with civilian politicians, how to think about war in a coherent way. But his other job is to operate at that higher level to get into the decision-making of the British state. He's also a member of the great think tank of the Edwardian era, the coefficients, where he's talking to Haldane, uh, Earl Grey, the foreign secretary and others. So he's mixing in the very place where those, deci those decisions will be made in a country where the civilians will always have the final say. And the problem he identifies, and it came out, I thought, very, very well in the lecture, is that the civilians don't have either the skill set or the linguistic ability to have that debate with the military. What's happened since Clausewitz's day, since Napoleon's day, is that military professionalism has created its own rhetoric. And that's not a rhetoric that liberal civilians in England are engaging with. They may be in other countries, but when we get to the outbreak of the First World War, the liberal cabinet literally has no idea how soldiers think, and they have no real idea what strategy should be. They have abdicated that responsibility through a very long period of peace. And Corbett's attempt to make sure they have the language and the intellectual equipment to have that debate ultimately fails. The decision making at the very beginning of the First World War reveals that the Liberal cabinet may have read Corbett's book, but they certainly haven't either understood it or internalized it, and they allow control of, of policy to drift away. Uh, Moltke won the argument in 1914 against the Bismarcks because the Bismarcks of Britain in 1914 had no understanding of the business of war. Uh, Bismarck certainly did understand war, and he understood why it needed to be controlled. Uh, 1914 British Liberal Cabinet doesn't do that. Um, I was very struck reading Corbett's diary that he doesn't make much of this um, failure of decision making, but he's going to spend the rest of his life trying to explain what went wrong, how British strategy was misdirected in the First World War, and how it should have been conducted. Because his job from 1914 until 1922 when he died is to write the official history of British ground strategy. How did the British actually make war? What could they have done if they'd actually thought about this and adopted something which is, he, he coins the phrase, a British way of war, a British way of making war, various different ways of doing that. It's a maritime strategy, it's not a naval strategy. And that's his point of departure from his near contemporary Alfred Thayer Mahan. Mahan is selling naval power to a continental Americans. And the same message works with continental Germans and other continental powers. But Corbett and other British contemporaries say, look, this isn't what we do. We actually have a maritime strategy. It's Navy led, it's global and it's maritime. And so Corbett's key 
text, Some Principles of Maritime Strategy, appears in the same year as Mahan's Naval Strategy. They're talking about different things uh, because Mahan is doing one job and Corbett is explaining to the British how they've always done business. Mahan is explaining to the Americans how they might want to do business going forward. And a big driver for Corbett, going back to those followers of, of, Corb of uh, Clausewitz who then took the message further, understanding what von der Goltz is saying is very important for Corbett because Goltz's work is appearing in English, in, in London, being translated and published by the same publishers who are producing the textbooks that are used at the Army Staff College and on the Naval War Course. So this literature, which is very much geared towards a particular audience in Imperial Germany, is becoming normative in British intellectual circles because it's, it's been translated. It's no longer a German text, it's an English text. And the English are reading it without that filter of understanding where it's coming from. And I think a lot of the mistakes that the army makes in the pre-First World War period are about thinking that there is a standardized approach to strategy and that von der Goltz is the guardian of that. It's very interesting that when Corbett reads Clausewitz, he ends up talking about him with Captain later Admiral Sir Edmund Slade, who is a, a Germanist and a serious student of Clausewitz. And the two men end up reading Rudolf von Kammerer's version of Clausewitz, which is much more amenable to the point that Kammerer makes, which, Klaus, which Corbett picks up on, Clausewitz is all about development. This is a text from which you can develop ideas. It's not a closed cycle. Von der Gaulle says, it's like this, and that's it. Clausewitz says, it's like this, but, and we can go forward. So it's a, it's a philosophy of war, not a theory of strategy. And this is what Corbett is, is essaying. Uh, I think some principles is as close to a, a philosophy of maritime strategy as we're going to get. It's capable of development. And this critical point about thinking down from the ultimate objective is something that Corbett sees in Nelson. We're familiar with Nelson winning great tactical battles, but ultimately Nelson is thinking strategically. He's thinking grand strategically because his objective is to bring the war to a conclusion as quickly as possible. And his tactics are invariably adjusted to suit the strategic objective. He fights each battle according to the strategic and political logic of the circumstance. So his tactics are in many ways merely a vehicle to the strategic end. When he attacks the Danes at Copenhagen, he uses mission control tactics to make sure that the battle can be stopped as quickly as possible. As soon as he thinks that he can call the battle off, he wants to defeat the Danes without doing any great damage. At Trafalgar, he adjusts his tactics to a completely crazy bow on approach because he has no time. There's a storm coming. He has to win this battle quickly or the war will go on much longer. So that ability is the province, I think, of some of the higher intellects that have been applied to strategy. And it's rare to think about Nelson as a strategist. Most people think of him as a tactician, but I, I see that his tactics are very much driven from the top downwards. Ultimately, this is about creating something that works in, a, in each context. And so strategy is constantly evolving as nations evolve, as their objectives evolve. And the legacy that Clausewitz and Corbett leave us, I think, is, a, is this philosophical approach that we have to think our way through this from the top all the way down to the bottom and we should always be aware that we're not going to fight the wars that they were thinking about you can't take the battle of jena out of clausewitz's writing and there are things in corbett's life that you can't take out of his writing he's a liberal imperialist he believes in the empire evolving into something else he sees a, a commonwealth he calls it a sea commonwealth as a future he sees maritime power as the the protecting agency that will enable Britain's formal empire to become something different, something that is moving into the 20th, 20th century. Because not only is he a civilian, but he is a progressive liberal civilian rather than a social conservative wearing a uniform. And that shapes the way he thinks strategically, shapes the way that he argues. His legal training gives him equipment. And the other thing that we haven't mentioned, of course, before he wrote about history or strategy, uh, he wrote some quite interesting Victorian novels, 
So his ability to express himself, to capture and play with ideas. These are novels of ideas. They're about really interesting facets in history. The first one of them is about the conversion of the Scandinavians to Christianity in the Viking era, something which clearly fascinated him um, as he traveled extensively in, in Norway. So Corbett's imagination is important, and I think that's a quality that Clausewitz shares with, and the ability to think through these things beyond uh, the original. And the legacy they leave us is texts that, that constantly give us the opportunity to think again. They're not closed cycles and if we use them properly they will give us a lot of the equipment we need to think going forward uh, i think they retain relevance because they're not trying to tell us what to do they're trying to help us think better for the future and that's a civilian and a military conversation and i think with both of them that civilian audience is the thing that tends to get forgotten but it's absolutely critical these men are writing about strategy for civilian decision makers thank you very much can I very briefly come back on particularly the last point that you made, because I find that very, very important. Um, it's the way in which you, we should all see both Clausewitz and Colbert, and in fact, any other um, author on strategy. These are not people who produce eternal truths. These are people whom we have to study. We have to ask, first of all, did what they wrote make sense in their own times? Was it a good and accurate and helpful interpretation of what was going on in their own times? Was it potentially of more timeless quality? Which part of it was potentially of that quality? And it is for us to make that judgment, which is why I always go slightly green in the face when people use their texts, particularly Clausewitz, as though this was the, the, you know, the gospel. This was something that had set down eternal rules, which you can now apply to African politics or, or cyberspace or whatever it is. Um, the question is always to say, does it make sense? Does it help us understand? Is it a way of in, ushering us into a new subject area? Does it help us unravel that? Does it help us come to grips with it? If not, let it fall immediately, drop it. Um, if it is helpful, pursue it, um, but don't see it as something that is a straitjacket from which you can't move left or right and that you can't get out of. Uh, think of it as a helpful tool rather than something that will be gospel and that will set the bounds of what you can think or interpret. And, and if I can just follow that one up, one of the great things that both of them do is give you a window into the, the intellectual world of the periods in which they're operating. They're both giving you access to things that lesser writers can't give you. They're, they're talking through the debates of the age. Clausewitz is talking about the options that Prussia has going forward post-Napoleon. Corbett is talking about Edwardian England in a period of tremendous transition. Uh, there are lots of things happening. He's, he's writing during the Second Anglo-Boer War. He's heavily involved in the, the question of home rule in Ireland the evolution of empire so he's these men are operating in a very dynamic political epoch both of them and that gives their work i think a, a quality because they're well aware that the world that they're writing in today is not going to last very long it's, it's a moving target so this is a snapshot if corbett had written some principles in 1909 or 1914 it would have been a different book it would have emphasized different aspects of, of what it was and it, it's highly likely um, that we would think differently about his work had he done so but that's the book that he wrote and he wrote it as a doctrine primer for the navy primarily to use at the strategic level in debates about national policy its, its ability to be used in the staff colleges is in, almost inevitable, given that's where it's teaching, but that primary audience is not uniform. The primary audience is meant to be civilian. And that's the audience he would want to have captured. It may explain why very few copies were sold before the First World War. Um, thank you, uh, Beatrice and Andrew. Um, we've got a little time remaining, um, so if I could ask the audience to put any questions in the uh, Q&A function, which should be at the bottom 
of their screen. Um, and while they're doing that, I'm, I'm going to abuse that my position as host a little bit and ask a question um, to allow you time to do that. Um, I was thinking beyond our, our, our theoretical and historical discussion today, and we're looking out into the, the world of the 21st century, um, some would say an exceptionally complex, divided, competitive world environment uh, with interweaved issues, energy security, finance, health, logistics, uh, tension within and outside nations. Um, what would be your, your key takeaways on thoughts for those who are perhaps trying to advise on a more intellectual basis or a strategy to policy makers and decision makers what trends signs importance from Corbett's and, and Clausewitz's experience can they can they harness to address these challenges shall I start and point you towards that wonderful passage that I read to you from Corbett where he talked about this interrelationship of some sorts, whether it was in a hierarchical way or whether it was on an equal basis, between anything to do with the use of the military, but also the political diplomatic position, as he called it, and commercial and financial positions um, of the country. I think in the Cold War, for reasons which retrospectively I'm finding difficult to understand, um, we were excessively focused in a lot of our studies on the military instrument of strategy. What we're currently seeing in particular, and what we have been seeing for the past few years, uh, is just how very important those other big uh, tools of strategy are, the economic uh, tool of strategy, and the, um, you know, the, the domination of things like, well, that's something that you couldn't have had in the Cold War, uh, the cyber sphere or the, the propaganda war. You did have propaganda uh, wars going on and, and contests going on, but the way in which information is now becoming um, a tool of strategy uh, just shows us how very, uh, and finance, how very important finances and debts and, and the way in which you're trying to freeze somebody's assets in, on the, in, user, in order to move them to certain things. Um, this is something which clearly Corbett already knew, which clearly Corbett already distinguished. I mean, Clausewitz says not a word about this, but for Corbett, this was really clear how very important these other tools of grand strategy or major strategy or whatever you call it are. And we see these wielded so very forcefully by uh, China in particular, of course, in the furtherance of what is so far still a benign overall strategy, i.e. a non-kinetic non one, one that is not aiming to kill people, uh, but and the, the not at all benign strategy of Russia, where um, the grain exports from Russia, but also from the Ukraine, are an actual really important tool of Russian strategy. Uh, the gas and oil, and oil exports, of course, are the one that you always think of as this huge big tool of strategy. How these other instruments also weigh in and side by side with the military and how we can't any longer think of strategy in the way in which you you know I, I plead guilty um, we thought for most of the cold war we were concentrated excessively on how the contest was being might be fought out in military sense how deterrence worked militarily etc I, I think that's absolutely right and Corbett's great advantage is that he quite literally lives on the proceeds of international high finance in the back of his diaries are dividend slips from a range of international companies. Um, that's where his money is invested. His brother is a city financier. He's also a member of parliament. So he's engaged with this on a day-to-day -day basis. This is the real world that he lives in. This is where his, his livelihood comes from. It's the money that enables him to do this job, which he wouldn't have been able to do under other circumstances. He's acutely aware of the way the world works because he's traveled around quite a lot of it. He's been around North America. He's been all the way through to India and around India. He's seen the French empire in Algeria. He spent a lot of time in Europe. So he's well-traveled. He has a very clear sense of, of a wider global world. And a key part of his writing, um, in 1907, he publishes England in the Seven Years' War. A key argument in there is how the British develop and refine their economic war strategy during that war using the law courts. He then publishes his fabulous essay, The Capture of Private Property in War, to diffuse attempts to, for freedom of the seas at the Second Hague Conference, uh, an essay so powerful that Mahan insisted on republishing it, uh, and Jackie Fisher made sure that happened. And it's Corbett who is shaping the way the British see the endgame of the First World War when they make sure that the Americans 
are not able to insist on absolute freedom of the seas in wartime. Um, that's Corbett's work, is preserving the primary weapon of the British state, which is not a navy, it's the ability the navy gives you to strike down the enemy's economic livelihood. And all the states that Britain has had tension and conflict with in the last 300 years have had economic vulnerabilities. They've often been different. Russia is as vulnerable economically as it was in the days of Peter the Great. If you stop buying everything the Russians export, their economy will choke. Um, fortunately for the West, Putin is actually doing that for us by blowing up his own pipelines uh, and cutting off his nose to spite his face, as it were. So identifying that as a primary strategic weapon gives the logic to why you don't need to fight for command of the sea. Uh, the British should be in a position to assume it as soon as the war breaks out, as they do in 1914, and exploit it. What do they do on the first day of the war? They cut Germany's international cable telegraph links to the rest of the world, and they start knocking down its long-range wireless relays in the Cameroon and in the South Pacific. So they cut off communications, they cut off commerce, and once the war gets going, they use open courts to stop people breaking the blockade of Germany. So again, they're using the law, they're using open source intelligence, they're using closed source intelligence, because that is the critical war effort that they've planned for. It's not going to win the war, but it's going to make it a lot more difficult for the central powers to win. And Corbett is not looking for a knockout, he's looking for a limited war brought to a negotiated settlement. So that weapon is very strong in the limited context, it's less strong in the total context. But Britain is not a total war state. It's ended up waging it. But Corbett is saying, if there is a British way of war, it's limited, it's maritime, it's economic. And that really brings all of the things that he knows together. And it links him up closely with the man who, who shaped a lot of his thinking, Jackie Fisher. And both of them absolutely hated the idea of war. So they see strategy as a way of securing objectives without war. And Fisher is a master of deterrence by display. That's Fisher's approach to war. He doesn't want to fight anybody. He wants to deter them and make them give in anyway. So if you can win wars without fighting, that's even more clever than winning them uh, with fighting. OK, we've got some questions here. So um, I'm going to read the first one. Uh, Given the reservations you both express about adherence to classical strategists as a mantra, Clausewitz more oft quoted than read, to what extent does the study of classical strategists inhibit rather than assist in framing modern strategy? Read, uh, a question by somebody who's the namesake of the great hero of tonight, um, Andy Corbett, I see. Um, I think it's very simple that if you apply a particular method to looking at these texts, they can be not inhibitions, but they can be uh, stimulants for more, more thought. And I think it's this idea of looking at them, first of all, to say, do they still make sense? Did they make sense at the time? Do they still make sense today? Rather than saying, oh, we have to see the world through that particular lens, looking at them critically from the outside, questioning whether they make sense now. And if they do, if they strike a chord with you and you think that this actually is a key to understanding your present situation, run with it. If they don't make sense, dismiss them and say, they're obviously not appropriate, at least for this particular context that I'm thinking of. And then they can be a stimulants for further uh, thought rather than um, a straitjacket that stops you from seeing a situation in another way. That would be my answer. Yeah, and uh, I would echo that and say, understand them in their own time. These are men of, of, a, of particular periods in time, of particular places, and they would not have written the book that they produced, but for circumstances, experience, uh, different experience. But if you take the, the men out of the book, the books aren't going to be very good at all. Th these are men explaining things which are complex and difficult to deal with, but they are real world events. So this is real strategic thinking, but it's real strategic thinking in the 1820s or the 1900s. And accept that it will be limited. Somebody once said to me, um, oh, Corbett's terrible. He doesn't say much about submarine warfare. Well, before 1914, nobody had done submarine warfare, so there was nothing to talk about. Um, you, you can't blame him for not writing the book that you wish he'd written, because he has been dead since 1922, uh, and 100 years have seen a bit of change. And the same with Clausewitz. You know, you, these are 
texts of the time. We don't read Shakespeare for wisdom about the 21st century. Um, we read it for wisdom about human nature, which is universal, and we should do the same with them. We should think about what they can do for us and make sure we don't ask them to do things that they're not capable of, of producing. They don't have access to the things that we are now dealing with. That's our job. We have to grow up and say, we, these are great contributors to the debate, but it's our job to interpret them in, in the 21st century. And that would be exactly what they would expect of us. Thank you. Um, next question, um, Julia asks, strategy has been successfully applied to the corporate and business sector, which only agrees with Dr. House's points that I fully agree with as well. Do you think that the use of strategy in the civil world has undermined in any means strategy? Yeah, uh, I'd like to take a slightly different take on this particular question, because on the one hand, it is perfectly clear that as everything is now strategy, as many of my colleagues have already commented, it seems to be a very hollow uh, uh, term and it is used absolutely for absolutely everything and therefore doesn't make very much sense any longer unless you define that this is about the uh, policies of a state, the overall policies of a state in a particular conflictual situation and the application of its many tools in a particular uh, conflictual approach. Um, but there's one thing that I do find that uh, military strategy or the use of all these different, uh, the coordination of all these different means of a state in a conflictual situation, of which military force is a very, very important one, if not the most important one, uh, and business strategy have something in common. Uh, and I'll just uh, abuse of your question to make this particular point, and that is that both need to coordinate very many conflicting considerations and bring together and coordinate the interests that many different groups have in the particular decision making that you're involved in. So particularly if you're in a democracy rather than in autocracy, uh, then the decision making involved in whether you're going to lock down your country for COVID or whether you're going to which tools you're going to apply in order to try to contain uh, Russian ex imperial neo imperialist expansionism uh, is going to be quite similar in some ways There's, it's going to be all about trying to persuade a lot of people to come on board, taking into account their diverging interests in the matter, trying to massage those trying to find compromises trying to bring everything together and I think this process is quite similar whether you're being you you're uh, the the prime minister leading a cabinet in a conflict situation in a war or whether you're trying to manage a national health system in the covid crisis something like that so there are similarities there and i think that also probably applies to business when you have lots of different when you're doing it at a level where you have lots of conflicting interests and lots of uh, parties with different and divergent interests that you somehow have to bring together in a leadership role Oh, excellent. Andrew, do you want to add anything to that? No, I'm, I'm content with that. Uh, the next question, I, I think this can, it, it's for Andrew, but I think Beatrice could probably weigh in this as well. Uh, could you expand on the process through which Corbett elaborates his concept of grand or major strategy? Um, do you happen to remember when he, what year he coined this term? Um, and other, were other naval scare scholars writing about this beforehand and similar concepts before the publication of some principles, as often the case, strategic thought is not original, is not exactly original, as pointed out Professor Hauser. Mm. I'm, I'm happy to let you go first. <laughs> no? Okay. What Corbett is doing, and I think this is critical when we look at the evolution of his thinking, He's not rushing into the strategic level. He's not rushing into writing some principles. Some principles is, is a slightly early, but a well-merited summation. What Corbett understands, and Clausewitz as well, the key to comprehension is a detailed analysis of real events. And that means going back into history to a point where we can analyze things in enough detail with enough access to real evidence to come up with meaningful analysis. Corbett starts that in the Tudor period in the, in the late 1890s, and he works fairly swiftly through. So he's 
been certainly using that term by 1911. It's probable, I think, that he's using it uh, a little before that. So what Corbett is doing is working from the Tudor period through to the 20th century, writing a series of strategic an analyses of major conflicts and in his England in the Mediterranean book of a period in which the England goes from being a minor player on the margins of Europe to becoming a great power by dominating the Mediterranean as a sea area. Uh, and that's a massive strategic transformation. European powers have always previously been continental and military, even when the English sought about, about power in Europe, they thought about the military. From 1700 onwards, the English are able to dominate the Mediterranean, and that makes them a great power without an army. And that's the basis of, of maritime thinking. So Corbett is, I think, quite distinctive from the other writers on naval maritime strategy of this period, because they tend to be writing synthetic treatments in which the past is merely an excuse to hang some ideas together. Uh, Mahan, as we know, came up with his arguments and then wrote some history to justify them. And most of his contemporaries, um, like Philip Colom uh, and others, are doing a pretty similar thing. They know the argument they want to make, and they're going to make it by selecting the examples that support their case. Corbett doesn't do this. He writes through the big issues, and he ends up, before the First World War, writing about the Russo-Japanese War, which is a, the, the most recent major maritime conflict. And the key thing in that is he doesn't do the easy thing. It would be very easy to say the Russo-Japanese War is a perfect example to use when you're talking about how Britain is going to operate in the future. But on page one, he says, actually, that isn't correct because Japan isn't like Britain. Japan is able to operate on the Asian mainland because it can operate in the Korean Peninsula, which is the nearest part of the, the mainland to Japan. The nearest part of the mainland to European mainland to Britain is northern France and Flanders. And if the English put an army into there, they're going to find themselves in serious trouble. But the Japanese can operate through Korea because it's a peninsula which can be cut off very largely by sea. And Japan's interests are continental and military rather than maritime and economic. So he's very clear about what he's talking about, he's very clear about what he's not talking about. And he's not trying to create a theory which is a one size fits all universal possession. He's read Clausewitz, he's read the Clausewitz commentaries, particularly on camera. He's discussed this with his students and he's come to a position where it's how do we use these great ideas going forward? And how do I put them down in a format which will allow my students, naval officers, and the people I want to influence, statesmen, to get this so they can have that conversation without the terminological problems of only one side of the conversation knowing what strategy is uh, and knowing what, what a decisive battle is. So he's, he's trying to educate the two sides of the British decision-making process into having a common set of ideas, a common language, and a common framework in which to discuss them. And to a point, that sort of works in the First World War, but nowhere near as well as it might have done. So grand strategy is for civilians and the military. He doesn't want the military dictating. He doesn't want the civilians simply deciding without consulting the military. He wants that conversation. And some principles is a facilitating device. If everybody's read the book, their conversation will be quicker and more effective. Thank you. Beatrice, do you want to add anything? Um, I think the next question uh, very much leads into uh, how continents versus islands view strategy and the sea, and uh, who is a sea power and who is not. And the question is, um, Corbett looked at strategy through a maritime lens, Clausewitz through that of a continental power, Mahan possibly through a fledgling nation's lens. Can we learn anything from China and their approach to the use of strategy? Does it differ? Here, by contrast, I am willing to weigh in, but I'm not a China expert. So I will point you to a rival series of podcasts 
which I have been working on with my colleague Paul O'Neill at the Royal United Services Institution, which you can find under RUSI Talking Strategy, where we have three episodes on three different shots of Chinese development, three very different strategies, and despite the fact that the last of these has taken off, a lot, uh, so the two of them have taken up a lot of the ideas of the first. Um, and those are, of course, uh, the Sun Tzu and um, Mao himself, and then Liu Huaqing. Um, I can point to two of them already online. Uh, Liu Han Hua Qing is episode five of our first series of talking strategies. This is the amazing uh, Chinese admiral who turned around Chinese strategy after 3000 years of concentrating on China's land uh, borders in the West and suddenly turning to the Navy side and turning to the sea in the 1990s, a strategy we're still living with today. Uh, Mao, who took up a lot of uh, Sun Tzu ideas, whose um, ideas, however, were also strongly influenced by European thinking, not least Clausewitz, but of course Marxist-Leninism. And uh, Sun Tzu himself, that is the first episode of series two, which has just gone online last week. So I point you to the real experts whom we interview in Talking Strategy. Look it up on the RUSI and you'll have two episodes there already online, a third coming. The thing that strikes me about the current fixation with China is that, predictably enough, the United States Navy is very keen that the Chinese People's Liberation Army Navy uh, should be a peer competitor uh, and should be seen as a justification for sustained or, or even expanded naval capability. PLAN is, is not a peer competitor for the United States Navy. That, that is not what it's doing. And if you look at its, its order of battle, it quite clearly isn't attempting to do that. What the Chinese are doing is acquiring the trappings of superpower, which include having aircraft carriers and ballistic missile submarines, but they haven't put a great deal of effort into building particularly good ones. Um, these are very useful symbols of status and power, but their military capabilities are significantly lower than one would expect uh, of an economy of that size. And when the Chinese use force at sea uh, to secure their objectives, it's striking how low down the, the violent spectrum they operate. Uh, fishing fleets uh, and local maritime militias are the primary instruments of, of Chinese expansion at sea because they're very difficult to counter with high-end naval force. So the Chinese are, are very carefully using a form of, of pressure at sea, which is the least likely to generate the high-end, technologically advanced response that the United States Navy might anticipate using. So I think we have to, we have to watch how China develops, but we have to make sure that we don't allow the Americans to tell us what the Chinese are about. Because I don't, I don't think from their public pronouncements, uh, they're as clear on this as they need to be. China is, is a very large, powerful state, and it has very clear agendas about its near abroad. Um, but as I said to somebody the other day, the Chinese are not planning to refight the Battle of Midway. They're not planning to surge into the Central Pacific and challenge American domination of, of the region there. They want to be protected in their regional area, and they see the sea as a vector for threats, and they want to be able to close that down. Uh, that's classic continental power approach to maritime threat. Um, if you want to know what, how the Russians think about maritime strategy, you have to go to Kronstadt. They built the world's biggest naval fortress to protect St. Petersburg. That, that's how states like Russia and China see the, see the sea. It's a threat. It's a vector for, for risk. Uh, and blocking it off and closing it down is very attractive. But acquiring it, using it, it's not necessary. Their, their power will come in other areas. So this is something they need to cover off. It's not something they need to dominate. And so if, if you're making those decisions as a strategist in, in Moscow or Beijing, that is not your priority. The priority is going to be in other places. So you have to be careful not to allow the rhetoric of Chinese expansion to perhaps um, exaggerate the reality the reality is, is not quite what the, the list makes it sound as it's, these are status symbols and the Navy is a status symbol. Uh, 
it's, it may become more effective over time, but the chances of it being used as an open sea threat to the United States Navy to Germany in the Pacific is, is very small. I think that's the, the last question from the audience. Um, so I will, I will abuse my position one final time and, and ask a question um, focusing more on, on policy making. Um, Sir Julian Corbett uh, demonstrated the symbiosis of relationship between the military and the civilian mind to work together to translate complex ideas into something policymakers and politicians can understand, irrelevant of if they, they then followed that. What can we take from Corbett or indeed Clausewitz and their, their experience of that, which might be useful to those today and tomorrow who are trying to, to in, in, inform policy making and, and convince this uh, sort of better approach using applied history to, to policy making? What can we take from this, their experience? I'll say one very quick thing, and I'll, I'll leave you with the last word to you, Gracious. Um, the best advice we can give anybody in that position, and there will be people in that position going forward, don't expect too much. Uh, don't expect to be taken too seriously because other things will always get in the way. And the, the very best of plans are invariably defeated by other issues. So do, you know, do your best, um, make sure that the arguments are clear, make sure that the people involved have heard them um, but don't expect that you are going to win that argument because there, are, there is always another hundred important things to factor in which are outside the strategic domain. And putting the economics and the finances in, uh, this is what we're looking at in 2022. Does the economic, financial and, and social problems caused by a spike in global gas prices impact your strategic decision making about the Ukraine crisis? Um, that's not a strategic decision, ultimately, that's a political call in a Western liberal democracy. Might not be in Russia, but it certainly is, is here. So that's where the politicians have to come in. Um, if they take strategic advice on their options as well, that's good. But ultimately, it's a political decision. A point for me is slightly different cut, um, because I think what I can say is complementing what um, Andrew Lambert just said, rather than uh, replacing it or in any way. Um, it's the, to find a common language. And clearly, the very clear writing of Corbett was extremely helpful to people in his own time, had they only read it, read the Green Pamphlet, read his, his uh, other work. Um, but today, I think one of the greatest problems is the two different languages that are spoken, that of the politicians, that of the military. They are completely different languages a lot of the time, particularly with all the acronyms, particularly with all the uh, expressions, you know, the many, many, many words that are used for small war, which go from low and Intensity conflict to operations other than war, etc., etc. You know, there's many, many terms that are constantly being reinvented. It's constantly labeling similar things with different labels because you've found, you've found something new. And there's this hell of the acronyms that you have to wade your way through when you're working in any co military context, uh, rather than having a clear language. And it is this is actually very why it is very important to have academics who can write very clearly, who have one foot in each of those uh, camps and who can articulate in a way that it allows politicians and the general public to understand what the issues are, but can also be understood by the military. So from that point of view, let me just uh, quote my late colleague, uh, Colin Gray, who talked about strategy being the bridge between the two. Uh, there has to be that writing that brings the two together that makes it possible for both sides to communicate with each other. And just having the same vocabulary that Corbett, as we just learned earlier, uh, furnished is so crucially important. Thank you. I, I think that's a very uh, good point to end on, right, clearly and coherently. And if there's any uh, King students attending, that's a, that's a good final message to uh, send to them. But um, I'm very grateful to our speakers today, two exceptional lecturers and lecturers. Um, I'm particularly grateful to Beatrice for accepting the invite from uh, us at King's to present. And I can, of course, advise our audience to explore Beatrice and Andrew's work further in their latest publications. So thank you for attending and the School of Security Studies aims to have this on our, our YouTube channel in the future. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Pleasure. Ah. Great. Thank you very much, Andy. That, I thought that was, went really, really well. Thank you for talking.